Germany 1945. 12 years of dictatorship and six years of war are over. A people who refer to themselves as the master race face the ruins of their past, an occupied country utterly demoralized. The old values have been thrown out, a new order has yet to be established. The post-war years are chaotic and cruel. Rapes and attacks, cannibalism, robbery and murder. Spectacular criminal cases are testimony to an era in which the world has been turned upside down. What were people capable of in those times? What drives them to such brutal acts? And how do criminals exploit the chaos of the post-war years? One in ten Germans have died in World War II. A quarter of all homes have been destroyed or badly damaged. Millions of people are fighting for survival. The years 1945 to 49 are some of the most understudied uh, years uh, in German history um, because there is a, uh, in the history books it's told that there is the history until 1945 with the apocalyptic end and then you have the founding of the two competing German states in 49. In these four very formative years, they are messy, they are complicated, but they are formative. With the war over, the Allies are in charge. They divide up Germany between them. The Soviet occupied the East, the British the Northwest, and the French and Americans the South. Garmisch Partenkirchen is in the US zone, the scene of a mysterious murder in 1947. This small place is nestled close to the Zugspitze, Germany's highest mountain. One December morning in 1947, a housemaid makes a horrific discovery. The restaurant owner, Tenta Hausner, lies lifeless on her kitchen floor, her skull smashed in. It must have been a pretty horrible sight. Tenta lying on the floor in a pool of blood, her skull smashed, and a knife through her neck, pinning her to the floorboards. Who was this woman? When the police arrive soon afterwards, curious neighbors get in their way. Possible clues are rendered useless. What's behind this murder? British writer Ian Sayer has a private archive where for years he's been gathering information about the post-war era in Germany, including the Tenter Hausner case. By 1945, she was uh, 35 years old. Um, she had red hair and um, uh, she was actually um, referred to by the popular press at the time as the uh, um, Red Princess, uh, Garmisch Nell, the Queen of Hearts. During the war, Tenter Hausner ran a popular restaurant in Munich. She was considered an ardent Nazi sympathizer she's alleged to have had a relationship with the head of the regional Nazi party, the Gauleiter of Upper Bavaria. In 1944, Tenterhausner moved to Garmisch-Partenkirchen on the border of Austria. The town is a magnet for drug smugglers and black marketeers after the war. Some 5,000 American GIs are stationed in Garmisch-Partenkirchen. They marched in in April 1945 and enjoy this mountainous idyll. But it conceals a shadowy world. A lot of the American military were involved in cigarette smuggling, uh, drug smuggling, and of course, 
all the many of the Germans as well. So yeah, totally lawless um, in Garmisch at that time, totally. Everyone meets at the Weisses Rössel, Tenter Hausner's restaurant. An affair with an American officer allows her to take over the popular establishment. He makes sure her connections with the Nazis are swept under the table. And the landlady knows how to manipulate. Smugglers and tricksters, GIs and policemen. Usually to her own advantage. Tenterhausner is not just charismatic, she's also a good businesswoman. The 35-year-old has her eyes everywhere, and she knows how to turn a profit with sensitive information. She was working for um, different sections of, uh, of, of the US military. I mean, uh, absolutely amazing. She played one side off against the other. She was working for um, uh, the American Army Counterintelligence Corps, uh, detachment in Garmisch, um, which is counter-espionage. Um, she worked for um, the US um, Army Criminal Investigation Department. Indeed, a secret document from the American military police shows Tenter Hausner is not just a narcotic smuggler, but also a source of unimaginable value. Tenter Hausner is leading a risky double life, and she knows it. She confesses to a friend how scared she is. That fear is not unfounded. The American occupying forces are planning to take action. The US Army already has a detailed report about the shady things going on in the town. Mention is also made of Tenter Hausner. Even General Lucius D. Clay, military governor of the US zone in Germany, is informed. The landlady knows none of this. On the 22nd of December 1947, she has a get-together with friends in her flat above the Weisses Russell. Her lover and an American officer are also present. They left at 3.30 in the morning, her guests testify later. Did Tenter Hausner have another visitor that night? Carsten Babian is a pathologist at University Clinic in Leipzig. He has analyzed the police report and put together his own theory about that mysterious night. I think she met someone she knew. Otherwise, she wouldn't have let him in at this hour and certainly wouldn't have received this person in a dressing gown. I think it was an acquaintance with whom she ate and drank. This wasn't a carefully planned murder. There was an argument, a fight. Emotions ran high. The weapons used in the attack were from the kitchen, suggesting a spontaneous act. The killer stabs Tenter Hausner with her own kitchen knife. Her severe head wounds were probably made by an axe. It was never found. The police initially believe they're dealing with robbery and murder. Expensive items of jewelry are missing. But why were 15,000 rice mark left in the living room not taken? The investigators question neighbors and acquaintances. The only clue? A man was seen standing in front of her house before the murder. Who is this stranger? Senterhausner had several affairs, one after the other. They generally ended quickly, and there was probably some jealousy involved. I think it must have been a crime of passion involving someone's hurt feelings, like revenge or rejection or something like that. The police briefly put one of her lovers under arrest, but they have no proof against him. Maybe her shady business dealings have something to do with her death. The US military also investigate, but the case files disappear and they still haven't been found. Maybe a clue that someone close to the Americans wanted to silence Senter Hausner? 
That's what Ian Sayer believes. The British writer is still looking for the missing piece of jewellery. It could yet help solve this mysterious case. Well, <clears throat> perhaps because of this distinctive uh, bracelet, because even, um, you know, 70-odd years later, this is a very distinctive piece of jewellery, and if it's still intact, it's worth a lot of, lot of money. There may be somebody who's seen it in, um, in a jewellery case somewhere. Somebody may have uh, actually had it to sort of to alter, to change. It's so distinctive that somebody, just somebody, might recognise it or recognise having done something with it. And that could lead to solving the crime, of course. The case of Tenterhausner is the story of a morally ambivalent woman looking to profit in difficult times. Maybe that sealed her fate. The post-war years posed major challenges for women. Until 1945, many have to look after themselves and provide for their children alone. If their husbands do ever come back from the front, they often don't get on anymore. Many couples divorce, three times as many as before the war. People's experience of violence in the Nazi era and in the war didn't just remain in their heads. The years right after the war were also an era of violence. Hunger forces many women to head out to the countryside to trade clothes or jewelry for a sack of potatoes or other food. But these journeys, known as hoarding trips, can be dangerous because a serial rapist is striking fear across Berlin and Brandenburg. Spandau Station in Berlin's British sector. Many people heading out to the country, into the Soviet zone, start their journey here. In April 1946, a young woman decides to take the train to Brandenburg. But she can't get a seat. There are too many people traveling. A man approaches her. He says he can help her get to where she wants to go the same day. She follows him. That's a fatal mistake. The young woman is called Barbara Schuler. She's just 19 years old. The perpetrator beats her and rapes her. Then he lets her go. The perpetrator knew that many women traveled without husbands because the husbands were prisoners of war, for example, or because the women were widows. And at the time, it was very easy to start a conversation and offer someone help. A little later, the perpetrator approaches a woman again. An East German film retells the story. Like Barbara Schuler, she also trusts the man. Over the next few months, the rapist strikes more frequently. He entices more and more women to the woods, attacks them, and rapes them, all to the north and east of the city. Why do the victims fall for his trick? Lydia Binneker is a criminal psychologist. She compares the testimonies of the women. The descriptions of the crime are similar. Such perpetrators are very manipulative and seem very friendly. He was always kind and suggested helping them, showing them a shortcut or helping them in some other way to reach their destination. And as soon as they were in the forest, his demeanor changed completely and he started to treat them in a really rough and domineering way insulting them and also using physical violence, beating them and brutally raping them. One thing in particular plays into the hands of the perpetrator, a police force that is still completely disorganized. Many police officers had actively supported the Nazi regime. They were part of it. The German police was deeply complicit in the Holocaust by bullets, the roving Einsatzgruppen, 
uh, that, ac uh, that accounted for roughly half of the victims of the Holocaust. So there was um, the need to revert back to uh, some kind of local police. Um, the only issue is, who can you trust? After the war, most policemen come in from other professions or they're just starting out. There's little experience or equipment. Historian Regina Stodikal explains how little they had to work with. The police had an emergency evidence collection kit with them. For example, there was a brush in it that you could pull out like this and use to take fingerprints. There was powder for that in here and also a small ruler for measuring splinters of glass or other small objects. And of course the obligatory magnifying glass. But this type of forensic evidence kit isn't going to provide conclusive findings. Today, forensic pathologist Carsten Babian has cutting-edge methods at his disposal, DNA tests and databases to identify perpetrators. What was feasible in the 1940s? Shortly after the war, biological clues were identified via blood groups and other characteristics. But they needed a relatively large amount of trace material, blood, saliva, sperm, and not just tiny droplets. They needed larger quantities. And it was much more difficult to link the material to a perpetrator than it is today. Today, we can say with 99.999% accuracy whether the sperm came from that man or not. That wasn't possible back then. So the police mainly rely on descriptions of the perpetrator. Many police files are stored at police headquarters on Alexanderplatz in the Soviet sector. One of the victims goes to try and identify the man. The police have photos and fingerprints. The victim says she recognizes the rapist in one of the photos. Willi Kimritz. Is he the rapist they're hunting? Kimritz comes from a neighborhood close to the crime scene. Lydia Binniger has established that he came from a simple background. There are several cases of abuse in the family. For the psychologist, it all adds up. Emotional neglect in this family is very likely. And especially in the case of serial offenders, you can see that these events early on in their lives have contributed to the low level of compassion and violent compulsions, which they then display later in their crimes. The police believe Willi Kimritz is the suspect. At 24, he had already been imprisoned for rape and again at 31 for theft and pimping. But Willi Kimritz only serves two years of his three-year sentence. As the Russian army approaches in 1945, he is freed in the confusion of the war's end. Since then, there's been no trace of him. In July 1948, the police are investigating a murder. A woman has been raped and strangled to death. It turns out the crime took place in the same section of woods where Barbara Schuler was raped two years ago. Is it possible that Willi Kimritz is behind this crime too? Serial offenders learn as they go along. Often the offences are first played through in their imaginations and then acted out. Their methods are refined over time. Strangulation as a cause of death can also be explained by the nature of the offence. The woman resists, tries to call for help, screams, and many perpetrators then simply try to stop this screaming by holding her mouth and nose shut or squeezing her neck. Soon, another two bodies turn up. Investigators from Berlin and Brandenburg start cooperating closely. It's the largest manhunt since the end of the war. Codename 
Operation Roland. There were checkpoints in the woods where they thought a murderer would come through. And they used police women as bait. They had to dress as women going on hoarding trips and try and strike up conversations with suspects. The investigators realize that the victims' apartments have been almost cleared out. The murderer must have taken their keys from the crime scene. Would a rapist do that? If he kills the woman, there will be no witness testimony, and he can enrich himself much more than if he just steals her personal effects. And so he draws the conclusion that killing his victims is much more profitable for him. The murder hunt is unsuccessful, until a chance drives the murderer into the net. In the autumn of 1948, a woman recognizes a man on the street. She last saw him with her friend, who later turned up dead. She immediately informs the police. It is indeed the suspect, Vili Kimritz. The police arrest and question him. He confesses to 23 rapes and four murders. He says he sold the items he stole on the black market for cash. The court condemns Vili Kimritz to death. The case shows how violent offenders are able to use the chaos of the post-war years and the dangers facing women in particular. Berlin is in the middle of the Soviet zone of occupation. Shortly after the end of the war, there are almost one and a half million Soviet soldiers in the East. They haven't got much time for the Germans. After the invasion of the Soviet Union by the German army and the horrible atrocities committed by them, I, like many other people, disliked the Germans. So I didn't want to have any contact with German civilians. Potsdam, July 1945. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill meets US President Harry S. Truman and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. They discuss the future of Germany. Relations between them quickly cool. The Cold War begins. The conflict between the Soviet Union and the Western allies was unavoidable, not just because of human rights violations and their contrasting approaches to Germany's economic development. It was a clash of world views. In June 1948, the Soviet Union closed transit routes to West Berlin. The three sectors had to be supplied by air. Civilians were still able to cross the border until construction of the wall in 1961. But the Berlin police were faced with a dilemma. It creates a host of logistical challenges. West Berlin police officers were not allowed to cross into the eastern sectors with guns. So that meant people who want to exploit that will. Berlin is an El Dorado for criminals and their gangs. Their members are often children, a direct result of the war. Even before the end of the war, all the old structures disappeared. Schools closed, traineeships were no longer available, parental authority disappeared, mothers were out all day. Many young people were alone because they got lost as they fled. So these young people had to survive in a society that was disintegrating and where social norms were no longer valid. Many young people hunted both food and excitement, with fatal consequences. The largest black market is on Berlin's Alexanderplatz in the Soviet sector. People go there to exchange almost anything. Food for fur coats, pearl necklaces for cigarettes. For many, the black market is a matter of survival. 
The police carry out daily raids. The black market is a paradise for thieves and con artists. One of them is 15-year-old Vanna Gladel. He tricks cigarette hawkers into accepting counterfeit money. The police catch him in the summer of 1947. Gladel spends four months behind bars, but that doesn't change his ways. Quite the opposite. Criminal psychologist Lydia Binnaker has studied Werner Glado's career in detail. What kind of perspective did he have? It was very unclear what was going to happen to this generation and how things would turn out. He wanted to be rich, he wanted a good life. He envisaged himself as a gangster of the type he'd seen in the movies. Al Capone was his great idol, and he believed he could become a major gangster boss who would put his stamp on the future Berlin. Glado gets out of jail and starts putting together a gang. In their heyday, they had more than 70 members. They specialize in car theft and burglary. They have covert names for each other. Glado himself is known as Doktorchen, Little Doctor, because he tells everyone he studied medicine for a few terms. He was so confident and charming, and he had the gift of the gab. And he soon managed to put together a whole group of men, not just young people, but older men too, and give them orders. So his narcissistic personality, combined with his intellect, were the foundation on which he built his gang. The boys are vain. They wear tailored suits like American gangsters. Their trademark, white ties. For some time, the public wonder who's behind the robberies. So does little Lutz Krieger. He reads about the notorious white ties in the newspaper. To us kids, it was as exciting as a crime story. And at the beginning, the gang drew a lot of admiration under the motto, we steal from the rich. But especially because the GLADO gang managed to disarm East German policemen, and we said, how soft can these police be to allow themselves to be disarmed? They managed to fool the police like this several times. But their misdemeanors are anything but childish pranks. Berlin Prenzlauer Berg in the Soviet sector. In April 1949, Glado robs a jewelry store here. The salesmen take up pursuit. Glado shoots and kills one of the men. It's his first murder. He escapes without being recognized. The gang boss is now almost 18 years old. Why is he so at ease with violence? Glado witnessed the Battle for Berlin in 1945 and even took part in it to a certain extent. The boys were given weapons and told to defend Berlin. You might say he learned to kill. Attacks, robberies, grievous bodily harm. Glado and his gang operated across the whole of Berlin and between sector borders as well. After a successful heist, the boys go to ground in a different sector. The police are powerless. Until one robbery changes things completely. In May 1949, Werner Glado tries to steal an escape car. He's got his eyes on a limousine. Glado tries to force the chauffeur out of the car at gunpoint. When the man resists, he pulls the trigger. The 44-year-old dies on the way to hospital. Later, Glado claims he never wanted to kill the chauffeur. That sounds unlikely to pathologist Karsten Babian. 
Es wurde ein 9 mm Projektil. They found a 9 mm projectile. That's a lot of power. If I shoot at a body at close range, even just the upper arm, then the bullet goes through the upper arm and enters the ribcage. And that's what happened in this case. The chauffeur bled to death as a result of bleeding from internal injuries caused by the shot. The petty thief has become a cold-blooded killer. I think Werner Glado was so stuck in the dream he'd seen in films from the US that he really couldn't see the consequences of his actions or that he had repeatedly been a danger to people's lives. He thought of the whole thing as an adventure. After the crime, Glado and his gangmates flee. But the police are hot on their heels. They find the getaway car later in Berlin's Muggelsee Lake in the east. A ballistic analysis shows that the projectile found at the scene of the crime is the same as that used in the jewelry heist. The police begin to hunt for the gang. It's a success. Witnesses come forward, accomplices testify. Three weeks later, the police pull up in front of Glado's apartment. The press report a wild shootout, and Werner's mother plays an active role in it. I can remember the police shooting through the door, and he shot through the doors from the flat. And because he'd been surprised by the police raid, he didn't have his trousers on. His mother helped him to get into his trousers in the midst of all the shooting. Glado is shot. In danger of bleeding to death, he surrenders. The Wochenschau news program in the Soviet-occupied zone covered his arrest. Werner Glado's apartment. The police captured him after a one-hour firefight. The Glado gang commits at least 127 serious crimes, including 19 robberies, two murders, and 15 attempted murders. Their boss is handed the death sentence three times over. Glado played it cool. He told the judge, yes, well, you can cut my head off once, but three times? That's desecration. Glado was cheeky, and he had a big mouth to the very end. That's also because he believed he would be pardoned. I don't think anybody really expected him to be put to death. Glado and his gang were part of a generation that knew nothing but the Nazi regime and war. But for the judges, that's no reason for clemency. On the 10th of November 1950, Werner Glado dies under the guillotine. The past has left its scars, not just on children and young people. More than 8 million former soldiers of the Wehrmacht, the German army, return home from prisoner of war camps up until the 1950s. Many of them are physically injured and traumatized, and they've committed and experienced violent acts. But the violence and death will continue. How far will people go in such extreme circumstances? One of the most brutal criminal cases of the post-war era unfolded in Dresden in the Soviet-occupied zone. In 1946, there's still a lot of rubble to clear away in Dresden. A week before Christmas Eve, a woman collecting wood makes a horrible discovery. Someone's lower leg wrapped in a piece of newspaper. Ash blonde hairs stick to the edge of the severed limbs. The newspaper has flecks of green ink on it. The police face a riddle. Whose legs are they? Pathologist Carson Babian identifies the extremities as belonging to an adult female. 
die Durchtrennung erfolgte im Kniegelenk. The cut was made in the gap of the knee joint, that is, where it is easiest to cut off a lower leg. The edges of the cut look very smooth, which means that a knife was used. Next to the lower legs lie the bones of two thighs. Particularly shocking, the flesh has been cut off. In the crime scene report, investigators speculate that the flesh of the dead may have been sold on the market. Are they hunting a cannibal? Dresden faces a winter of famine in 1946. As everywhere in Germany, people die of malnourishment and cold. Did someone eat the flesh of the victim? A few days after the body parts are found, the Dresden police get their first lead. The police department are alerted to a possible crime. Kater Stieler and her seven-year-old son, Heinz, have been missing since the 11th of December. Do the severed legs belong to this woman? And what happened to the child? He left the flat together with his mother at about 4 p.m. Nobody has seen them since. Police suspect they're dealing with a capital crime, murder. But who could be the perpetrator? The majority of homicides are carried out by people in the victim's direct vicinity. The probability of being killed by partners, relatives and acquaintances is relatively high. Very rarely are the perpetrator and victim unknown to each other. That's the logic the police use. They start at the place where Kita Stieler works, a company producing light bulbs. The investigators notice green ink being used at her workplace. Is it the same kind as that found on newspaper the body parts were wrapped in? Kater Stieler's colleagues say they often saw the missing woman with a co-worker, 34-year-old Frieda Lehmann. Is she connected to the disappearance of mother and child? Her address puts her under suspicion. Her flat is just a few hundred meters from where the body parts were found in Talstrasse. Frieda Lehmann lives here alone. Her husband has been missing since the war. The police find a bag and gloves. Both belong to the missing woman. A calendar entry also grabs their attention. An S written in green ink. Does the letter stand for the name Stieler? In the living room and kitchen, the police find traces of dried blood. They're certain something terrible happened here. They arrest Frieda Lehmann. At Dresden Police Headquarters, she tangles herself up in lies. At first, she maintains that a stranger killed Kata Stieler and the child. Then, she says it was her brother. Eventually, she confesses to the crime. Her statement says that she put a knife to the throat of her victim and pulled it back hard in the direction of her neck. She stole the weapon at a butcher's. The police are skeptical. Is a woman really capable of committing such a brutal act alone? Carsten Babian compares her statement with the pathology report. The incision was in the neck and penetrated through to the spinal column, so six, seven or eight centimeters through flesh. The pathologist believes a woman could be behind it because she used the knife swiftly, giving her victim no time to defend herself. Kater Stieler sits shocked in the kitchen. After the knife attack, she manages to get up, but collapses in the living room. Carsten Babian has an explanation for the amount of blood in the flat. 
When an artery is cut open, the blood spouts out like a fountain. So we find traces of blood one, even two meters away, on the floor, on the walls, on the furniture. That kind of blood loss alone can result in death. Generally, the victims suffocate on their own blood before that, breathing it in via the open airways. But until that happens, minutes can pass, during which the victim can still act. Frieda Leben then kills the seven-year-old. After the crime, she breaks into their apartment and steals clothes and other items. She's motivated by greed and envy. But that's not all. The murderer chops up both bodies and spreads them around Dresden. First, they find the legs, then investigators find the heads and the bodies. What kind of person is capable of such a barbaric act? Lydia Binnecker studies Frieda Lehmann's childhood. Her father was a violent alcoholic. She says that's a pretty good indication. She is someone who never learned what empathy really is or human connection. So she is clearly emotionally numbed by all her experiences. And this numbness is the foundation of her ability to commit an act like this later on. Lydia Binnecke believes Frieda Lehmann cut up both of her victims for pragmatic reasons. Because of their weight, she wouldn't have been able to get rid of the bodies if they were whole. But why do some body parts never turn up at all? During the trial, words like cannibalism and human flesh-eating are used. At first, the accused claims she burned several pieces of flesh in the oven, and then she says she gave them to her neighbors. They confirm that and detail the exact amounts. They thought it was horse meat. Is that credible? What is meat anyway? Muscle tissue looks the same in humans as it does in animals after they're slaughtered. So I believe it's possible that the neighbors didn't realize it was human flesh. What motivates the killer to distribute her neighbor's flesh to her neighbors? Maybe she wanted to show off a bit and show them, look, I have something great here and I can give you some, to boost her image a bit, because she gave away some of the items she stole. Frieda Lehmann is condemned to death under the guillotine and taken to the prison complex on Munchenerplatz. Today, the building is a memorial. It's run by Birgit Zack. Here you can see the container that catches the head. This is a guillotine from Berlin, which was out on loan to Dresden, because the authorities in Dresden didn't have their own guillotine. The executioner was also brought in with his assistant, and they carried out the execution. Today, a concrete block marks the spot where the guillotine stood. Frieda Lehmann's death sentence is carried out in July 1947. Her brutal act is a symbol of society's breakdown and of an age of extremes in which survivors of the war were looking for a moral framework and a new order. For the Allied powers, the denazification of Germany is one of their biggest challenges. How do you rebuild a society that is not only physically broken, but also morally deeply corrupted? In the post-war era, the Allies vigorously pursue leading Nazis. Starting with the Nuremberg Trials, which began in November 1945, and during which top Nazis like Hermann Goering were brought to justice for the war of aggression, crimes towards the civilian population, and the Holocaust. 
After the big trial held by the International Military Court in Nuremberg against the key war criminals, there were a host of subsequent trials that continued until 1948 and 1949. War criminals and top Nazis were still being executed in 1948. The Nuremberg judges sentence 36 Nazis to death. 22 of those sentences are carried out. They're not the last ones before the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. January 1948, a country road in southwestern Germany in the French zone. A truck driver picks up a hitchhiker. Shortly afterwards, the driver is murdered. Shot with this army pistol. A premeditated act? After the grisly murder, the hitchhiker pulls his victim out of the truck and hides him in a ditch under a tarpaulin. That same night, a police patrol comes across the body. A forester finds the truck. The wheels are missing. That's how they get the killer. The police catch him trying to sell the wheels, just three days after the murder. The perpetrator is 27-year-old Richard Schu, a former soldier in the German army. Did the violence he experienced in the war turn him into a killer? The judge said that on the one hand, a person is more likely to use weapons when they already know how to use one and also know what it feels like to kill a person. On the other hand, the judge also said quite correctly that many people fought in the war, but very few would commit such a crime and that it's not a sufficient explanation for such an act. The court in Tübingen condemns Richard Schu to death for murder and aggravated robbery. He is scheduled to be executed in the following year, February 1949. At the same time, the Parliamentary Council is meeting in Bonn. Its members are tasked with drafting a new constitution for West Germany and heralding a new beginning politically. The death sentence is also up for discussion because the Nazis used it to execute more than 30,000 people. Politicians like Konrad Adenauer, who would later become Chancellor, want to retain the death penalty. Many Germans support him. The whole issue of the death penalty shows that not much had changed in people's heads after 1945. A majority of Germans still supported it. And if there'd been a referendum on the death penalty in 1948, it would have been kept in place. Richard Chu isn't privy to these political debates. He's spending the last few weeks remaining to him in a cell. In July 1948, his family enter a plea for mercy. He is supported by the prison warden. He says Shu has acknowledged the severity and moral depravity of his crime and displays genuine and bitter remorse. The death of his mother contributed to his change of character, says the warden. She drowned herself after his sentence was announced. Shu seeks help at the final hour. It's a race against time. But the court rejects his family's plea for mercy. Even with debate about abolishing the death sentence in full swing, help seems to be coming too late for Richard Shu. Richard Shu clearly hoped to the very end that he would not be executed. And when he found out that he really was going to be executed the next day at 6 a.m., he was genuinely shocked and scared and became very emotional. Full of remorse, he pens letters, desperately seeking to explain his crime, but in vain. 
The execution is set for the 18th of February, 1949. The executioner installs the guillotine in the inner courtyard of Tübingen Prison. It has to be brought in especially for the execution. Then, it's time. In Tübingen, journalist Hans-Joachim Lang has studied the case. It was six o'clock in the morning. Twelve witnesses were present from the town. Richard Schuh was brought in. The priest recited a short prayer with him. And the chief prosecutor said to the executioner, I give you Richard Schuh for you to make him pass from life to death. They say he was quite calm in those last few seconds. Richard Chu dies aged 28. The execution bell rings out at Tübingen City Hall. It's the last death sentence carried out on the orders of a West German court. With the introduction of Germany's constitution, its basic law, the death penalty is abolished. This legal text is the foundation of the new Federal Republic, founded on the 23rd of May, 1949, under the eyes of the whole world. Its first chancellor is CDU politician Konrad Adenauer. Just five months later, on the 7th of October, 1949, the head of the communist SED declares the creation of the German Democratic Republic. Unlike West Germany, East Germany holds on to the death penalty until the 1980s. The creation of the two German nations in 1949 marked a turning point. And the crimes of the post-war era illustrate the challenges faced by Germany and its people in the wake of National Socialism and war.